So, oh. uh, Maris, would, would you just introduce uh, yourself to us? Who are you? Yes, who are I'm? Uh, where am I? I'm a psychiatrist. I was a psychiatrist, I'm still a psychiatrist. But a psychiatrist with interest in social psychiatry, that means you study the relationship between the mental health problems and the context of people's life, how they live, what has happened, etc. So I have not been very much uh, in favor of clinical psychiatry, which is more trying to uh, formulate the problems into illness categories. Mm -hmm. We try to formulate the problem into social categories. So that was your training? You were trained as a social psychiatrist? No, I was trained as a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and then I started work, I started my PhD as a social mm -hmm. in that kind of thing. Because uh, why uh, my PhD is about why people got into a hospital. Okay. That's not because of their illness, but that's because of the interaction between patient, doctor and family. Mm -hmm. And who wins is the problem. Well, this isn't a particularly well-known form of psychiatry. No, no. So no, in Holland it is quite well-known, mm -hmm. but it's also reduced in size because in Holland we had a separate community mental mm -hmm. health and clinical psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So you could choose where to work. Okay. You're a professor of psychiatry. What also, does that mean? That means that I was a full professor teaching in uh, the University of Maastricht. Started there when the University of Maastricht was uh, new, came into existence. The Maastricht had a university and we started there, and that was difficult, with a medical uh, school. And the medical school is quite complicated way of starting a university. Most, it's easier to start philosophy because you don't need a hospital, you don't need all services. So that's where I started to become a professor. And I was then with the first 10 of people, we, uh, we prepared the first curriculum in one year together with the 10, which was a very nice uh, time. And I was responsible for psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Right, so you, you're never just a practitioner. You always no, had an interest no, no, in, no, no, in no. education and research. I was always research. practicing, but not just, uh, not only yeah, a practitioner. Yeah, of course, you combined the two. I have always combined it mm -hmm. because five days being involved with people's problems is much mm -hmm. too much, and it reduces your focus mm -hmm. too much. So, in in these in these years of uh, research and education, what kind of emphasis was did, did your work take you? What, what, did oh. you? what did you focus on <clears> at that time? At that time I started to write books to, for the teaching because there was not much written about social psychiatry. So I have written a book about epidemiolo epidemiology mm -hmm. and the book about the services mm -hmm. and the general issues, basic principles of social psychiatry. So that were the first three books to start also a material for the education. Mm -hmm. We had another system in Maastricht. We didn't give lectures, but we formed groups who mm -hmm. prepared a subject from different point of views. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it was more vivid than most universities. So you, you, you spent most of your career in Maastricht? Or? No, no, I was 40 when I became a professor in Maastricht. Before that, I was a director of a community mental health service mm -hmm. in Amsterdam director for part-time and uh, part of uh, senior uh, researcher at the University of, Maast of Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. That was Amsterdam. So Maastricht, that was, I migrated, you could say, yeah, so to what, took, what took you to the Deep South? What was the opportunity that you no, saw? No, to that? become a professor in ah, a okay. new university. Mm -hmm. And I like that mm -hmm. because I think as a professor you can have more uh, possibilities to give structure to what you are doing. Mm -hmm. and to uh, put your ideas into students' sure, sure. education. But this it sounds like a lot of your uh, research and your, uh, what you were writing about, this teaching materials, were about sort of delivering a service in a good way or trying to think about yeah. ways that you could yeah. uh, act action a good way of working. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's move a little forward. Um, what interested you, Marius, in this issue, Hearing Voices? Not at all. <laughs> and we didn't call it hearing voices at the time. We call it auditory hallucinations. And I was not specially interested 
it was just one of the problems you met as a psychiatrist with patients. Mm -hmm. But then where did time, it, where did it all go wrong? No, it doesn't <laughs> go wrong, but it, it it went well, I think. <laughs> but I, this, I met Patsy. She was not very happy with the way I reacted on her problem of hearing voices, which I called at the time auditory hallucinations. Not because I called it auditory hallucinations, but because I only used this as an, uh, a way of coming to a diagnosis. And she said, my, my problem is that these voices are troubling me. They all give orders and I have to uh, obey these orders and they restrict my freedom. So I rather would like how to cope with them or how to get rid of them. And she didn't react on medication, so, uh, and I never give much medication because if small dose doesn't work, a big dose doesn't better work. So <clears throat> we then, but I didn't know what to ask about hearing voices. So we started to talk about her voices, but she didn't, the voices didn't trust me, I think. And so she, they forbid her to talk about them. And then we, I thought together with her, ah, what can we do? You write down at home what you experience and then you bring this book with you and you read to me here what you have heard from them. And in that way, we got more interested in what the voices uh, were saying and their characteristics. But still, she was, yeah, I didn't know how to change that. So she became more suicidal because she became more isolated because the voices forbid to do her many things. And that reason became that I thought how to break through this isolation. I might have her to talk to another voice here and then they anyhow exchange their experience because they both have the same experience. And it might be good to talk about their experience instead of only being afraid. So we did and they liked and I sit down there and I was always uh, listening but it was very strange for a psychiatrist to listen to these strange stories. But they together were perfectly happy and understood each other very well. So that I thought, hey, then there is really something they hear because they recognize from each other the experience. And I also doubted in the beginning if hearing voices is really hearing voices. So I was like all the other psychiatrists. They think about, yeah, it's something make up, it's something coming from the anxiety, but it's the other way around. The, the voices make them afraid. Now, all that kind of things went on and I tried a number of other people hearing voices to talk with Patsy and after a while they said we like we like to talk about them but we uh, do not know what to do yet so we don't become much wiser and then I thought yeah if this is a real experience then there must be in this world somebody who knows to cope with it I mean then it's not that exceptional that, uh, that with all the things people also have ideas about it which I might have not so then Sandra came in and Sandra is working with me already 25 years as you know and from that point she was not that long in, um, in, the, in our group because she was engaged as a journalist to learn the young scientists write their stories and that was a very nice idea but then you know, it, it took her interest also and she proposed to go for the uh, talk show uh, on television because we had to have a, a way of getting to people who hear voices and, and in a way that people are not ashamed, ashamed to tell about them. So that the television is very good because you come into every house room or uh, living room and nobody is obliged to uh, react or not. So then we found a talk show and that talk show also wanted naturally Patsy to talk about her problem and Patsy took the consequence of her longing to get uh, something 
better to know about her voices. And uh, she told her story and I said that psychiatry didn't know much about hearing voices and how to handle them, so that we were looking for people who could handle them well. Because uh, Patsy didn't and my other patients neither did, so we were just looking and asked people who could cope with them who to, to react. And we had organized a team at the telephone, so that they took their addresses and uh, that we could reach them uh, afterwards. Because we also planned already at the time that we would organize a congress for voice years, which was, well, which was the original ID, and you have always to have something new on television. That's the Sandra knew that if you want to go on television, you have to fantasize the, something new. So we thought, why not make a congress of people hearing voices to bring them together? Because that they liked. And then we expected a few reactions, but we got 700 people telephoning after this uh, talk show. And from that 700, 500 people said they heard voices themselves. So we couldn't visit them, so we made an enquête and a questionnaire. And the questionnaire we composed together with Patsy, the, the, what the people had told at the telephone to when they telephoned after the talk show. So for instance, when person said, I hear 10 voices, we asked the question, how many voices do you hear? And Patsy selected relevant information, because we didn't know what is relevant information at the time. And from there on, we built up the interview from questions which were to uh, told about at the telephone and then Patsy found them relevant information so we made the question where did it start, what happened at the time, how many voices, what kind of uh, characteristics that do the voices have. So that all kind of things that are now in the interview. And so we made a questionnaire of 30 questions with the last question, do you like to attend a conference on hearing voices, to get together with other people hearing voices, and they were quite positive about that. So that was the start of getting into the public, mm -hmm. to get quickly into contact with other voice hearers. So this was like an investigation at this stage? You investigation. Could say, yeah. And that was very nice because at that conference we selected people who could tell their story very well to become the speakers at that congress. And then at that Congress, uh, uh, Strauss, uh, a well-known uh, scientist about research of schizophrenia, because at the time we all thought about the interaction with schizophrenia, which soon after was clear that there are quite some other people than schizophrenics hearing voices, because at that reaction from those people, we also heard that they have heard voices but never had been patients. And that provoked the interest, in fact. Hey, that's something special. Now we it's see people... You're talking about yourself right now. It, 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 expressed, it, it provoked your interest. Yeah, okay. it provoked our, no, and Sandra's Sandra interest, too, yeah. naturally, because mm -hmm. uh, that was interesting in itself. Eh, too. Mm -hmm. And that was where we started also the research, is this the same? those who hear voices and become patients and those who don't. So the first accepting voices tell you a small number of people and compare those who hear voices and become patients with those who don't become patients and live their life free and are more positive also about their voices. And that comparison was then also published by in the Schizophrenia Bulletin, and that uh, was something many people, hey, were waking up and said, hey, this is an interesting thing. So we got many, many, many reactions on the Schizophrenia Bulletin article in 1989, which was mostly written by Strauss, but for us as a ghost writer, because he knows better to write English than we do. And that's still the case. We always need somebody who <laughs> wrote better, write better English, but that's uh, 
no great trouble to no. find uh, we experienced. So this, this bulletin journal article, was it, uh, how was it received? You got a lot of reaction, good reaction? Very, reaction? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Mm. The, the people were interested in what, mm. hey, what's this? And then mm. put forward all kinds of questions we couldn't answer because we did not know very much at the time. So we studied this questionnaire because they, uh, hun uh, a, f a few hundred people filled in the questionnaire we have sent around because we could meet them all and personally interview them all. So we had this questionnaire sent out to 400 people about and we got back 178 people who we could be sure they had experienced auditory hallucinations or hearing voices with the characteristics of auditory hallucinations as psychiatry formulates, which in itself is a reasonable formulation, that they are hearing uh, sentences or words without being a source in the outer world where these words come from, and they experience it as not me. It's not my brain, it's, it's just from somebody else. So. <clears throat> And these comparisons between the patients and the non-patients, we call them, meant that it became clear that it is the same experience, only the, the patients are afraid of this experience and the non-patients are not afraid of this experience. And that's the most clear differences between those groups. And that also has set on the cognitive therapy uh, group in England to start doing research about coping, diff coping with voices. And then they developed more from their own ideas, cognitive strategies, but they never came further than the coping. And our research always followed the steps of the voiceers because afterwards they also told us in this, mm -hmm. already in the first context, that it was related in 70% they told to traumatic mm -hmm. experiences. But we didn't realize that at the moment. It's written up in the mm -hmm. article already, but we never stopped uh, as important. Mm. That came later when you talked about with more people hearing voices, you got more and more the, uh, the information that they related to the, because uh, to the, what they had happened in their lives because one of the questions is when did your voice hearing experience start and what has happened at that time in your life so that's a question actually what is by most people uh, answer quite clearly and so you can come into the relationship with what happened in the world and many people has had traumatic experiences like sexual abuse, physical abuse, mm -hmm. being emotionally neglected. That means that they don't know how to cope with emotions because they never learned to express mm -hmm. emotions. In many families, emotions are not very val much validated. In all our society, emotions are always a bit ambivalent. When it's nice, it's okay. But when it's not nice, they immediately start to uh, say ho ho, or let's have a cup of tea. <laughs> in England, yeah. yeah in England. <laughs> so, okay, can I just look back at what you just said there and ask a few questions about that? One of the things I thought was quite interesting from the seed of this.